I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Some of you have graduated from healthcare and are back in independent living. Congratulations. Yay. Um, so this is a dialogue. I'm going to speak and uh, introduce my staff. We have the largest department on campus. And, um, and I was going to say the most educated, but I don't want to brag. Um, but no, we have some amazing, amazing staff. So I, I'll start with Faye, is our director of nursing. <laughs> Faye's been here going on four years, three years. It seems like four. <laughs> yeah. And um, Ashley Bell, she's our scheduler. And, uh, she's very busy. It's CNA week this week, so we're celebrating our CNAs every day with tacos this morning, we have a luncheon on Wednesday, we're doing a lot for the CNAs because they are the hardest working group in healthcare. And then everybody knows Big John. He had hair when he started 36 years ago. He's been with us 18 years? Wow, 22 or three years, that's a long time. Yeah. And that's amazing. There's, you know, there's a lot of turnover in healthcare uh, in our industry, but we have not seen that here at the Arc. Um, and then Jerome, Jerome, and he, Jerome does uh, all the ordering of equipment, supplies, uh, keeps up with our inventory, does some IT work, helps out transportation, schedules all our transportation. What else, Jerome? He helps me with my phone. Yeah. And he's also a DJ. And then everybody knows Arlena, our registered dietitian. She's a big part of our interdisciplinary team. So, huh? uh, and she is dietitian of the year. And also she won the pureed uh, competition uh, last year. So she's... And she's been here five years in October, five years. And she came to us from Incarnate Word, right? UTSA, yes, this was her first job with us. And she also acts as a regional dietitian for Morrison. So she goes to other facilities to help them out and give them advice and things of that nature and train. And then we have Regina Bryson. She's my administrator in training, and she's also a 30-year RN, and she comes to us Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then she works um, at Stone Oak Methodist, and so she's got to do a thousand hours of internship, and Margie, my last AIT, is, is helping to train her. Margie is the director of Crestway. And she's been with us, well, the first year or two she volunteered because she was doing her AIT. And then she came on as Central Supply and then became the AL manager almost two years ago. <clears throat> yep. okay. So she's, she just has to test. She has a bachelor's <laughs> in healthcare administration. Okay. Uh, our next, Meredith Lorena. Uh, uh, many, many of you remember her from COVID times. She did quite a bit of COVID testing with us in independent living, but she is our one of our MDS coordinators. And what she does, we have these long assessments that we have to do. And she does the assessments based upon others' documentation, interviews and things of that nature, and sends those in to CMS. And that's how we get paid. Um, based upon the uh, uh, the assessments, yes. So then, could you do fewer acronyms and more words? Oh, <laughs> sure. Min minimum data set. Now it's really it should be maximum because it's so long, but and it's changed. Uh, that the four, we, they have we have a new section that we have to uh, document more functional abilities and things of that nature, and therapy also helps out with that. Um, so they're all involved in the MDS, and that includes social work, dietary, um, nursing, everybody. And then we have Diana Lorenzo. She's 
our business office manager. She's been at the ARC eight years and she worked in dietary and then she was security. She got her associates in business and she came to healthcare. Now she's got a, uh, she picked up very quickly. She does all our long-term care billing for our residents and that's about 40 plus. Um, she does the census. Um, she does quite a bit of things and, and she's also proficient in computer and that helps me out uh, quite a bit. And then Diana De Leon. Um, technically she belongs to marketing, but she is marketing for Lakeside and Crestway and uh, a little bit for healthcare as it arises. So she's been with us almost a year. No, oh, four months? Oh my gosh. Okay. But she was, a, she was an ombudsman in Corpus Christi for 25 years. 34 years. I'm just emphasizing how long the longevity. And so we have, we have others, and Ricky's not here today uh, yet. He was here at our town hall on Friday talking about our CNA school. So he teaches the CNA school starting at three o'clock, so he comes in a little, little bit later. Um, so since this is a dialogue, we're just gonna open uh, up the floor to questions. And um, we're not gonna talk about any other departments because we're the best. <laughs> and um, we want you to, uh, to, to just ask us anything you've always wanted to know about healthcare, assisted living, um, therapy, Part B therapy also is included in healthcare. Um, Jerome has the microphone, so let's get to it. Independent living has a residence council. Um, how do the, the residents in healthcare and their families communicate with you, their needs, and sure council for them? We have a uh, that is a regulation. So we do have a resident council um, in Crestway and and healthcare and Lakeside. Now the resident council in healthcare um, is not. Um, very formal due to the level of dementia in healthcare. Uh, but they meet once a month, they go through issues um, and concerns and we follow up on those. Um, we also have, and that Crestway has their own resident council as well. And the same really goes for Crestway. Uh, I don't know Margie if you would agree with this. It is a meeting and we go over issues but it's not real we don't have a president and a vice president. It's a very informal process. Now Lakeside's uh, resident council is very, is very active and the council meetings are uh, well attended. We also have a dietary committee meeting over at Lakeside that's separate from resident council. But um, that, that resident council is very active. Um, to, and we also, I want to compliment our ombudsman, um, Sarah, what's her last name? Foster. Sarah Foster comes to our campus regularly and rounds and talks to residents and she also gives us feedback. I've been doing this 25 years and I've never had an ombudsman that was as active uh, as Sarah. Okay, there you go. Now I'm finished. Uh, there's a lot of interest uh, in aging in place, and I wondered how you're progressing with how that's going to work for the individuals that want to stay in their apartments or cottages. We are, um, so our uh, committee, Continuum of Care Committee, uh, is focusing on that issue. I know Sharon Taylor is on our committee, uh, Sandra Boyd, uh, Colonel Dubcheck, and we are coming up with some creative ways to provide care in independent living. Um, and that means uh, either getting a home health agency in with skilled people that's different from John's sitters, um, or expanding John's agency to include um, uh, nursing staff or doing it on our own, um, just to pro provide nursing staff. It would be a different role than Lucy. Um, they would be able, it would be, we would have to use registered nurses and they, because they have the scope of their license. So we're progressing 
we'd like to get, get going faster um, and that is our focus. We're looking at other things as well, that which includes the renovation and those other issues. One question on that uh, as a tag along, uh, what, what would that cost residents to do that in, in their homes or, or apartments? Uh, I, we don't, we're not that far along. Um, it, would, it, would, it would just depend upon um, uh, the cost. I mean, you, you can get a visit by a nurse to set up your medications or order your medications. So uh, I'm working with Steve and we're coming up with some ideas about uh, having you use some of your health care benefit in your home. And what would that do to our business model currently that we are operating? It would expand the business model. Uh, we would have ancillary, uh, increased ancillary services um, at, here at the R. But I'm talking about moving through the continuum in terms of your revenue and the, the levels of care. Uh, were, you, were you going to downsize skilled nursing as a result, in, in other words? <coughs> well, we, we are probably going to downsize skilled nursing because <coughs> we never run over 50 residents. We're licensed for 91. We've never gone come close to 91 residents in in healthcare and i don't know historically if that's if that's occurred but yes we will downsize healthcare uh to what um the historically we have been running um we we, we will be using a, a consultant an expert on telling us helping us figure out what is the right size for uh skilled nursing and do you have a firm date on completion on that, Suzanne? Uh, no, because there's so much involved. When you do when you do a renovation in a licensed building, it has to go through the, the state and the architect uh, department in Austin. So it depends upon how bu busy they are. And then uh, if in, during the renovation, it's gonna be a phasing. So we're looking at probably three years from when construction starts and ends. Just one last question, how does your uh, interdisciplinary committee work in, in practice? Okay, well, um, first of all, we meet every morning, and uh, before that meeting, Diana does the census. And so the census is updated on a daily basis because there's movement, people discharge, people come in, and then the whole team, we go through the residents that are, say, are unskilled or on TRICARE tri for Life, and then um, we also meet three times a week with therapy to discuss the progress uh, that our folks are making in therapy. In addition, we have care plan meetings, which is uh, attended by all the interdisciplinary team, which includes social work, MDS, nursing, uh, activities, um, or Lena's there, the registered dietitian, to discuss all aspects of the residents condition and um, so the, these guys meet together all the time and they work well together and um, I think that leads to the success of so many of our residents in terms of meeting their therapy goals and getting home or going to assisted living perhaps. Is one of the factors that you're considering uh, what sort of bothers me in the high rise if you if you have those in independent living that need the extra care about the safety factor if something were to require evacuation. Is that a factor that you consider? Uh, that would really be resident services and facilities. Um, we have our own evacuation plan and uh, we evacuate more than we like to because an alarm goes off or um, you know there's smoke in the Crestway kitchen closet or something of that nature. But uh, there's a whole separate evacuation plan that is uh, was designed by James and Chief Hogan and, and resident services and um, at the front desk security in that department. That would have to be very well integrated within what you're doing and the overall plan for evacuation, I would think. Yes, and it's because there's uh, fire doors between uh, the high rise and healthcare, um, certainly, if there's a, an alarm here, we would not evacuate healthcare, and vice versa. If if we have alarms going off, you would not have to evacuate. 
and if fire alarms going off in health care, we wouldn't evacuate independent living. Now, that being said, Chief Hogan is very, loves evacuations. <laughs> and um, he, we, uh, we know that if the alarm goes off, we are starting to evacuate because he's gonna get mad at us if we do, don't. Um, residents don't like it, but it, it's a good exercise for the staff. <laughs> I believe that you talked about 20 plus people who are in uh, long-term care in healthcare. And um, I think our first uh, uh, observation when we came here is, oh, we're independent living, then we'll go to assisted living, and then maybe we'll go to healthcare for a short period of time. But obviously that's, that's not how it happens or can happen. Right. What is the line in the sand that makes someone have to go to long-term care versus assisted living. Is, is there a yes. definition? <clears throat> there is a line in the sand for that. So if a, a, a person requires uh, a two-person transfer, meaning it takes two of our staff to get them from the bed to the wheelchair to it, wherever else they, they need to go. So that, that is the main criteria. And also um, there's some things like peg tubes, colostomy. If you can manage your own peg tube or your own colostomy, then um, you can stay in AL as long as you want to. And you can self-medicate in assisted living. But if you require assistance with say IVs or things, chronic uh, serious um, issues, then healthcare, you need the skill of our nursing in healthcare. And so th that's the main criteria. Now, we have one person now in healthcare that's gone through all the continuum. She was an in independent living uh, uh, AL for five years and now she's in healthcare. And she's 100 years old. So if you look around, we have, uh, of course I call it God's living room. Uh, we have quite a few centenarians in our area. Um, in, in Prestway and in healthcare. But age is not a factor. We have somebody that's 104 at Crestway. How many over 100? Four over 100 in Crestway. I know sometimes in an assisted living, you talk about um, the medical model and the social model. Mm -hmm. If you can explain the sure. difference and are sure. there different models, let's say in Crestway as opposed to Lakeside. Sure. Um, so I, I really think that Lakeside, because of the participation in resident council, and there's um, less dementia, more independence. We have four or five uh, folks that still drive. So I see Lakeside as more of a social model. Not, not to say that we don't have people that have you know, serious medical issues, but Crestway, ten, we have um, five people in hospice. Okay. Five people in hospice at Crestway, and there's higher acuity at Crestway. And it's better because um, they're right next to healthcare. So they're right around the corner. And so the proximity, if they need assistance from one of our nurses in healthcare, they can go over. But we do have 24 hour nursing in um, all, of, all three buildings. Now, if you go out to the for-profits, you're gonna see more social models because they don't staff like we do. And you're gonna see people giving medication that don't have a CNA or a med aid or they're delegated by an RN. That is legal in Texas. But um, we, we would, I, I mean, being healthcare director, I would never um, think that that's a good idea. Um, yes, Ms. Curry. Yes, uh, if there's a question about billing from healthcare, who, who, who can help resolve those issues, Diana or the finance office? Both. So where should I start? Uh, finance. <laughs> We don't have access to statements. Um, we, we get the statements after they've been uh, published. 
-hmm. or they've been done. So, so in some places I've worked, we had access, we could go in and look at your statement. We don't have that here at the ARC. So it's better to start uh, with finance. We can advocate for you, certainly. Diana can, we'll bug them and bug them and bug them. Um, but it's really uh, starts in finance. Suzanne, I've got a question for you. What, is there a difference in eligibility requirements for people coming into our healthcare system as opposed to coming in through independent living? Yes, so that is uh, called a direct admit. And um, a direct admit has ha would have to have served. They don't have to be uh, a retired officer, a commissioned officer, high level civil servant. Um, they have to have served, they have to be able to afford us and they have to have generally all of our direct admits have uh, Medicare and TRICARE for life. So we do like when we're not not real busy and we have open beds, we will accept a direct admit into healthcare. You will never be replaced by a direct admit. We don't, you know, you're our priority here at the ARC. 